Good morning. The Bible does a couple things. It tells us what to believe, and it tells us how to behave. And when you look at it, one of those things usually comes first, is what to believe and how to behave. What to believe is about the things that we need to keep in our mind, the things that we need to believe about God, others, and ourselves. And the Bible tells us about those things. It tells us that there are certain things we are to believe about God, but it also tells us how to behave, how to, where to, we are to conduct ourselves with others. And what we'll find is that before it tells us how to behave, it tells us what to believe. And that's what we find even in the book of Romans. Uh, Paul never had the chance to get to Rome. And if you know, the books in the Bible, like the book of Romans in the Bible, is a letter. And it's a letter written by Paul to this church. They would have met in homes. They didn't have church structures and church buildings, at least not the, the ones that met on the Sunday, which is when the church met. And so what they would do, these letters would be sent, and when there were gatherings of Christians, they would take this letter and circulate it, and they would read it. And so Paul's letter to the Romans is the letter that he wrote to be read by the churches in Rome. And what he wanted to do, he never had the chance to see them. So he was planning on making a trip there. And what he wanted to do is introduce himself. So when he got there, they would have had time to be able to think about what he felt like was important. If you were going to have a meeting with somebody and you wanted them to understand what you stood for, what you believed, and what you wanted from them, it would be helpful for you to send some material ahead of him ahead of time so that they could look at it. That's what Paul did. And that's what the letter to the Romans is. And in the first 11 chapters, he tells them what to believe. And then in the 12th chapter, he says, therefore, and he starts to tell them what to behave. And what he tells them are things that help them to improve their serve. He says a couple things. Have the right reason, find the right place, and be the right person. We're going to look at those things, and we're going to review briefly, and we're going to land on the first of his instructions, which are behavior-oriented. But let's look briefly, then, at what he wants us to believe about serving. Have the right reason. Have the right reason. And what he focuses them on is God's mercy. Look what it says in your worship folders. Letter A. And there's from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of of worship. There's a couple words that we need to look at. The first word we need to look at is mercy. Mercy means to come to the aid Mercy is to come to the aid of someone in need and it's when you see somebody in distress and because they are in distress you take action to be able to alleviate their distress. You give them what they need in order to be more comfortable. You take away their pain. You give them what they need. That's what it means. It means to come to the aid of someone in need, and it's the result of commitments. When it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, on the basis of God's mercy or because of God's mercy, this is what it's saying. The right reason to serve is because of God's mercy. And what it means is this, because God comes to the aid of people in need and because make, God makes commitments to us, therefore, we should, because God makes commitments to us, we should turn around and serve other people. It comes from, when the, the word mercy comes from the whole idea about covenants. In the Bible, God clarifies what he wants us to do and what he commits to do by making covenants. I've talked about them before, but let me, let me review briefly. A covenant is a treaty between people or nations. So if I represent a powerful nation and you represent a nation that is being threatened, and say you've called this meeting because there are enemies that are seeking to attack you and you want to appeal to me as the king of a powerful nation and you want to have me protect you, we would form a covenant and this is the way it would go. I, as the king of the powerful nation, would be called the suzerain. 
That was the dominant, the superior king. Your king would be called the vassal. And the way covenants worked is that there would be an agreement that would be very solemn, very sacred. And in the agreement, we would clarify a couple of things. We would clarify what my responsibilities were. Now, I am the suzerain king. I represent the dominant nation. And usually what that meant is if the neighbors that, are, uh, that you're afraid of would attack you as the suzerain, then I would send my troops to protect you. And that's what you would get from me. I would promise, swear a sacred oath, that when you are attacked by nations around you, you can count on me. I will send my troops to protect you. And in return, there would be things that you would do. You would... You don't have to protect me because I'm able to protect myself. Usually what would happen is you would send me gold or silver. You would send me lumber or supplies. And you'd send me so much every year. If you do your part of the bargain, I do my part of the bargain. That's what a covenant is, and that's what God establishes with us. So you think of the covenant God made at Mount Sinai. God promises to be the provider and protector. Let's see how sharp you are. God would be the vassal of the suzerain. Suzerain, the powerful one. God promises to provide and protect. What are the things that they need to do in order for God to do what he will do? What are those things called? The Ten Commandments. Those are the obligations that God places on them as the vassal. This is what you need to do in order for me to do what I do. Um, when the vassal was threatened, say your nation is being threatened, and I am far away in this other nation, I receive word from you that you're being attacked. I might not feel like coming to protect you, but the act of my sending the troops is called mercy, or the Hebrew word is hesed. It's mercy, same thing. Now, I might not feel like supporting you, but the fact is I have made solemn commitments to you that I will abide by. Therefore, mercy is the result of solid, firm commitments. It's not the result of emotion. I might feel like supporting you or not. I might feel, not feel like sending my troops, but that doesn't matter. I have entered into a covenant with you, and I will keep my commitments God's involvement with us is based on compassion-driven commitments, not on emotion. And you say, well, what difference does it make? I think it does make a difference. Sometimes if we think that God's compassion is driven by emotion, we might get the impression that he's like us, feels like supporting us sometime, and then he doesn't feel like supporting us other times. But the fact is that God's support is not driven by emotion. God doesn't support us and come to our aid because he feels like it. He supports us because he has committed himself to. And that's why we focus on his commitments. God will keep his commitments. As a, as a suzerain, we can count on him to be faithful to do that. We don't need to worry about God being tired with us. Oh, I supported you yesterday, and, and now you ask me to support you again, and I'm tired of supporting you. God would never get tired of supporting because God never fails to keep a commitment. God's involvement with us is based on something that is sturdy and solid, not soft and sentimental. Sometimes you hear people talk about God as, and he has a motion for us, that you're the apple of his eye and God loves you. And, and God's love could be seen from that perspective. But when it describes God, his love is active, solid, something that you could put your weight upon, something that you can depend on. Another word is the word spiritual. Spiritual. Spiritual means a couple things. It means reasonable and logical. And what we find then with God is that because God committed himself to meet your needs, commit yourself to meet the needs of others in his name. When it says that it's your spiritual act of worship, again, spiritual, it doesn't have the sense of something holy or sacred. The word really, it comes from the word from which we get the word logic. And when you think of something, and 
you consider it and you reason it out, then you make a decision. That decision would be called a spiritual or really a reasonable decision. If I am a good, powerful suzerain, you've seen my faithfulness. It would be reasonable for you to do what I ask you to do because I have kept my commitments and it's reasonable for you to serve me. That's what God wants. He wants us to look at how he has behaved and because he is faithful, he's shown himself to be faithful, that it is reasonable for us to offer ourselves to him in service and that's what he wants. For us to put ourselves at his beck and call because it's reasonable to do so. Why? Because God comes to the aid of people in need and we can trust him to come to our aid. Therefore, it makes sense to serve him. I think the the seventh step prayer of Alcoholics Anonymous gets it right. When you, in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you come to a place where You identify the fact that you're powerless over the addiction, that you need a higher power. And what happens, though, within the program is that in the fourth step, you write down an inventory of the things that you've done that you're not very proud of. You say that to somebody as part of the fifth step. And then in the sixth step, you communicate a willingness, a willingness that God would remove everything that that you have admitted are defects of character. And then in the step seven prayer, here's what it says, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I think this is an excellent paraphrase of what it says in Romans 12.1. I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. That's what this prayer is saying. And when you give yourself to God, you're not just giving him the good. You're giving him the whole plan. You're giving him everything in yourself. It's not that you have to separate the good and the bad, that you need to do the work first. It's that you offer yourself as you are, a combination of good and bad. You offer yourself to him. And that's the first part of the prayer. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me. Good and bad. But that's not where it stops. Here's where it goes on. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my... What do you think it says next? It could say a bunch of different words. Okay. What do you want God to remove? Defects of character that stand in the way of... Happiness. Remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my happiness. Joyfulness. Is that what it says? Usefulness. Usefulness. Remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. That's what Romans 12, 1 is saying. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. And what you do is what the seventh step prayer of Alcoholics Anonymous suggests that we do, which is this. Say, God, I want you to have all of me. I'm not going to separate out all the good and the bad in me because there is good and there is bad. I'm going to give you myself, and I ask that you remove from me everything that stands in the way of usefulness. Would you agree with me that the list of defects of character that stand in the way of happiness might be different from the defects of character that stand in the way of usefulness? Would you agree with me? There would be something on both of those lists, don't you think? There would be some similarities. I think that those lists would look different in terms of what was number one and what was number five. And that's what it's asked. It's, that's what it's asking for here. Remove from me the things that stand in the way of usefulness. Usefulness, that list. Find the right place, service. Look what it says in Romans 12, 4 through 6. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. You've been given a spiritual gift. 
And what it means, and as we look at this and what it seems to say, don't serve because God needs you to. Now, God gives you a gift that enables you to serve Him. Uh, a capacity that you can contribute to make a difference in the life of somebody else and in the life of the community. But don't serve because God needs you to. He doesn't need your service. He'll be fine without it. He's not dependent on it in the sense that if you don't serve Him, He's on His last dime. He's not. He never is. He doesn't need our service. He doesn't need our money. He'll use it. But He'll be fine without it. See, we don't serve because... It benefits him, really. It benefits us and the community that we're a part of. Serve because God has equipped you to and because it is part of experiencing his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It says that when you present your bodies as living sacrifices, what you end up doing is you experience or prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I guess what it means is this. If we are going to experience God's will for us, and are going to get to a place where we see, gee, you know what? God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. In order to do that, we will have to come to a place, because it seems reasonable for us to do so, to offer our bodies to Him in service and say, God, here it's all of me. Remove everything that stands in the way of usefulness. I want to serve you. And what it seems to say then? If we do that, we will experience, you know what, your will is good, acceptable, and perfect. But that will will be experienced as we learn to serve. So you say, Mike, what are you saying? I guess I'm saying this. Don't serve because anyone needs you to. Not even this church. Not because God needs you to. Serve because it's part of his will for you. And if you're going to experience his good, pleasing, and perfect will, service is a part of the deal. And you say, well, what am I? God has given us a capacity, each of us an ability. And we find God has given you a spiritual gift. As we said a couple of weeks ago, if God has given you a gift, it is his will for you to use it in serving others. We think about what God, what's God's will for my life. <clears throat> I'm interested in that. You're interested in God's will for your life. Well, I think that's safe to say. God's good and experience his will is what we want. If God gives each of us a gift... An individual gift. He doesn't give you the same gift he gives me necessarily. If he gives us a gift, it is it his will that we use it? If you're shaking your head, think what you're shaking your head to. Ooh. And this is not by way of I'm going to lay this load down on you and and make you come up and and make you because it can't be forced. If it's forced, it's for the wrong reason. It's because it's logical and reasonable that God serves and therefore we serve. But it is his will that we serve him. That doesn't have to happen in a church. It means that we use what he's given us to meet the needs of others. He gives us different gift. I've told you the story before, but let me tell it another, one more time. Once upon a time, right after creation, all the animals formed a school. They established a well-rounded curriculum of swimming, running, climbing, and flying. All the animals were required to take all the courses. The duck excelled at swimming. In fact, he was better than the instructor, but he only made passing grades in climbing. He was very poor in running. He was so slow, he had to stay after school to practice running. This caused his webbed feet to become so badly worn, he became only average in swimming, but average was quite acceptable, so no one ever worried about it except the duck. The rabbit was the top of her class at running, but after a while, she developed a twitch in her leg from all the time she spent in the water trying to improve her swimming. The squirrel was a peak performer climbing, but was constantly frustrated in flying class. His body became so worn from all the hard landings, he did not do well in climbing and ended up being pretty poor in running. The eagle was a continual problem student. She was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing class, she would always beat everyone else to the top of the tree, but insisted on using her own way to get there. Each of the animals had a particular design. When they did what they were designed to do, they excelled. When they tried to operate outside their area of expertise, they were not nearly as effective. Serve because God has equipped you to serve, and he gives you a capacity to do some things that will enable you to do some things well. Uh, Have the right reason. Because of God's mercy, because he's compassionate with you, and he would have you 
be part of what he's doing in turning yourself out towards meeting the needs of other people. Why would you do that? Because God does it to you, and you want to be a part of what he's doing in this world. Find the right place. What is your gift? What capacity has he given you? On his behalf, use it. Encouragement, hospitality. Mark passed out a list last week. It was broken up into different categories. Serve. And the thing that it seems to get to in Romans is be the right person. So it's have the right reason, which is God's mercy. Find the right place, which is service. Be the right person. And the first thing it talks about is love. Look what it says on the sheet. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. In the passage Mark talked about last week, it talked about spiritual gifts. We're not talking about spiritual gifts anymore here. We're talking not about finding the right specific place. We're talking about things that we're broadly commanded to do. It's not, oh, yeah, 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 that's fine, Mike. I don't have the gift of love. So I don't need to worry about being loving. I don't have to worry about all the things you're saying. It's not my spiritual gift. It's not talking about spiritual gifts anymore. It's, it's describing the kind of things that God wants us to do. And what he, the top of the list, let love must be sincere. Um, sincere means not hypocritical. That's literally what it means. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. What do you think that means? You know, hypocritical love can mean a couple things. You know, it means, oh, wonderful to see you. No, it isn't. Remember the movie, it says, there's two things I don't like about you. Your face. Think about it. That's what it means to be hypocritical, to be two-faced. To show one face out here, but then have something different happening in, inside. And it could mean that. You know, you hear sometimes, fake it till you feel it. I don't think that's what it's... That's not what it's getting after. Um, I think what it's, what it's saying is, is this. Don't say you love someone and not show it in serving them. I think that's what hypocritical love is in the context. Why? Look what it says again. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. I think what it means for love to be non-hypocritical is that your love is an expression of serving others. And so the thing that it would be getting after is something like this. I'm serving you. I am washing your feet. And I'm washing your feet. Maybe something like that. You, you know, I'm not saying run out and wash somebody's feet, but if I really care about your feet, it's one thing. But if I'm washing your feet, I hope you're seeing this. You know, I'm, I'm washing your feet, but it's really not about you. I'm using you to get something for me. And I think that's what it's saying here. Love must be non-hypocritical. Not only don't just say it and not show it, when you show it, have the right reason. Have the right reason. Um, saying, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Don't just say you love someone and not show it in some tangible way. Uh, hey, what we find biblically is that... Um, It's um, love flows through the hands. Look what it says in 1 John 3, 16 to 17. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Uh, look what it says. Let's read that one more time. This is, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Clearly, in the Bible it says love is a verb. It's not a noun. Love isn't something that you fall into or fall out of. It's not an emotion, really. Love is something you do for somebody else. Because God has been merciful towards you, you, you extend yourself in meeting the needs of others. You don't just say, I love you. If you've got something you can share with them, love is active. It gives a person 
what he needs because that's what God did for us. He didn't say, I, I really care about what's happening. He came to give us what we need. He sent his son to be our savior. And what he would have us do then is do the same thing. Not just see somebody in distress and say, I love you, and not do anything, but do something about it. Uh, the good that is described is about serving others when it says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. What is good? Good is when you do something to help somebody. Evil is when we don't. Um, love flows through the hands. True as well that love flows from the heart. As important as service is, service is not an end in itself. You can find a place where people are serving, maybe a church, where there's all kinds of service happening. People are broken up into groups, and, and it's very service-oriented. And that's something that would seem to guarantee that this is a church that's doing what God wants, but it's not a guarantee that everything is as God wants it. Look at the passage, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. In the first three verses there, when it talks about people speaking in the tongue of men out of angels, they, if they have all faith, they have all knowledge, what it's describing, people with spiritual gifts. They have spiritual gifts that found the right place. They are exercising their God-given gift in some way. But even though they've found the right place, it seems to say because they're not the right people, because they're not serving with the right attitude, their serving is not registering what God would want it to, to do. It is not making the impact that God would want it to have. Um, if I were to, I, I won't do it, if, if there was a symbol over there, and I took, and I just, you know, it's clashing, it's, it's loud. A symbol is abrasive when it's by itself. And what he's describing is service that is done without love as a motivation is like a clanging cymbal. It's brash. It's, it assaults. It doesn't soothe. And what he's indicating is that we could find the right place, but if we're not the right people, finding the right place doesn't make a difference. So it seems then that in terms of order of importance, have the right reason, be the right person, and then... Finding the right place would mean serving in a way that will be in line with what God would, would have us to do. This passage is frequently quoted at weddings, and it should be. It talks about love. But the context of it, it's not about a wedding. It's about a church. And it's about people in the church that have spiritual gifts, but the way they are stewarding these gifts, the way that they're using them, is not with love. It, and that's why it describes what love looks like. And so let's turn it upside down. So when people using the gift, they were, they were impatient. What I'm taking is the list, and I'll put the negative because this is what was happening. When they, you, they were using their gifts without love, they were using them and they were impatient with one another. They were unkind to each other. They were envious, boastful, and proud. They were using their gift, but people wanted the gift that was the upfront gift. And they, they created a pecking order at this church in Corinth where if you had a certain kind of gift, you were chicken one, and you got to look down on chickens two through ten. There was a pecking order dependent on what kind of gift you had. If you had a gift that allowed you to do miraculous things, you were kind of the top of the heap. Those with a simpler gift were at the bottom. There was that type of dynamic here. They were rude and self-seeking, easily angered, keeping track of being wronged, delighting in evil and not rejoicing with the truth. And this is what was happening in this place. So they found the right place to serve. They found a gift, 
but their service didn't make a kingdom difference because it was associated with this type of attitude. They found the right place, but were not the right type of people. Being the wrong person wiped out any benefit from finding the right place. God saw their, saw their motives, even if others didn't. So you might say with me, okay. You're supposed to have the right reason, find the right place, and be the right person. It's hard to change the inside motives. What do we do about that? How can we be the right person, have the right reason? Why would you serve? Why? Why bother to roll up your sleeves? Why bother expending yourself for somebody else? Fair question. Why not just do what's comfortable for you? Why don't I just do what's comfortable for me? Why would we put ourselves in a place where we are expending ourselves for others? It says, I urge you, therefore, brothers, on the basis of God's mercy, because God is actively compassionate towards people in need, and he's actively compassionate towards us, that it makes sense and is reasonable for us to turn around and be compassionate towards others. Another reason is that as we do so, we will experience his will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I guess here's the question. God... He's asking. Remember that step seven prayer? Is that something that you can say? My creator, I'm willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and others. Is that where you are? I'm going to say it again. That's the prayer. Can you say that? Some of you, that's exactly where you are. My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I ask that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. That kind of decision will lead to being a servant. It will lead you to serve people that you might not be all that comfortable in serving. You don't get to choose who you serve when you choose to be a servant. However, you'll experience what God's will is, his good, acceptable, and perfect will. In terms of how we can be the right person, have the right reason, look what it says in 1 John 4. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We love because he first loved us. What it means then is focus on his commitments. We've been talking a lot about this. Listen to me. If I were to get up here and do this guilt trip on you to try to get you to serve, putting some kind of fear, motivation on you, probably could get to a place where we could generate some activity. That would have zero kingdom impact. Why? Because God's interested in motive. And he would have us serve because we're willing to. And in order for that to happen, I would, I would say, and I'd the, the longer I'm a believer in Christ, the more firmly I believe this. We cannot be willing until we are aware of and believing in his commitments to us. I think that's the whole point of the passage. Have the right reason leads to being the right person and finding the right place. We've been thinking about the commitments because as we're aware of God's commitments to us, it generates in us a willingness to do the things that service requires us to do. If we're not focusing on his commitments to us, we're giving away, but nobody's putting anything in. And you know what happens in that case? You get dried out, don't we? We get dried out. We start to resent what we have to do. We start to become envious, impatient, unkind. We start to become really angry easily. When you see those type of things, impatience, unkindness, 
when you see yourself being easily angered, being rude and boastful and proud, when you see yourself keeping a, a record of wrongs, I'm going to give you some advice. Think about God's commitments to you. You're saying, what will that do? Let's try it. God sees you. And he sympathizes with you. He understands what you're going through. He deals gently with you. He loves you and wants you to come to the throne of grace. He changes you. He chooses you. Good is ahead of you. Good is guaranteed to you. He will give you the power to persevere. He will give you the power to be content. And what I think, Scripture, what ends up happening as we focus on his commitment, something softens inside. The thing that drives anger starts to melt a little bit. That's why, have the right reason, be aware of his commitments, and on the basis of that, give yourself in service. And if you find yourself getting short, well, know your heart. Quiet your heart. How do you quiet your heart? Focusing on your commitments to him? Is that how you quiet your heart? No. Do you quiet your heart by serving other people and make sure he's looking? That doesn't work either. You quiet your heart by sharing and demanding from God? No, you quiet your heart on the basis of his commitments. Know your heart. Quiet your heart. Then share your heart with God and others, and then give your heart. When we focus on having the right reason and being the right person, we have no problem finding the right place. We're going to experience communion now. Um, I'm going to keep this thing up here. Let me tell you a little story. And then we're going to have music. As the music is being played, come up and take the juice and the bread. And as we do so, we come as a community. And let me tell you the story. I think I've told you before. A man spoke with the Lord about heaven and hell. I will show you hell, said the Lord. And they went into a room which had a large pot of stew in the middle. The smell was delicious, and around the pot sat people who were famished and desperate. All were holding spoons with very long handles, which reached the pot, but because the handles of the spoons were longer than their arms, it was impossible to get the stew into their mouths, and their suffering was terrible. You get that image? Big pot of stew, big long spoons, forks, and everybody starving around this table. Now I will show you heaven, says the Lord. And they went into an identical room. There was a similar pot of stew. The people had the same identical spoons, but they were well-nourished, talking, and happy. At first, the man did not understand. It's simple, said the Lord. You see, they have learned to feed each other. And as we come as a community to the table, that is the image. We're part of a community, and God has given us gifts. As we steward this gift, these gifts, in serving one another, it's like feeding each other. Some of you are wonderful at being hospitable. Some of you are encouraging. You have knowledge. You have different gifts and abilities. As we have the right reason, find the right place, and be the right people, then the body is built up and the impact goes out. So as you come to the table, be aware of a couple things. Be aware that we're coming as community, that God has called us together as a community. And as you function, we are built up. But God also calls you as one who he makes individual commitments to. And God always keeps his commitments because as a suzerain, he's never not kept them. So come and be aware of his commitments to you and his offer to you, which is find your place in service. And be the right person as you serve. Again, the music's going to play. Come on up and get the elements. Drink the juice. Eat the bread sometime during the songs. And as you do so, think about Jesus. And if you want to model for someone who's aware of commitments and serve, he's your man. The Lord give us the awareness of that which will allow us to um, find the right place and be the right person seems like that's about your mercy. And on, on the basis of your mercy, that can happen. We can find a place of service and
be involved in that service with, and be the right person. Um, and your mercy is about your commitments to us. It's not necessarily emotional, but it is faithful. And I ask you would give us an increasing awareness of and belief in your commitments to us so that we could serve. And not only that, but our service would not be laced with pride and all those things that characterize service out of resentment. And the only, again, way around that is is to be aware of your commitment to us, your goodness to us, to believe that. And it softens us inside. So I guess I'd ask that you'd continue to do that, both in and through us, so that we might be the individuals in the community you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I was going to say I'll be in the back. And if you did want to, we should have some of those books next week. They said that we'd be able to get those in, those 